Um, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit um, about how Bristol has changed and developed its event strategy uh, over the past kind of 10 years almost, and how that's really led for us to be kind of a positive force for action within the city, uh, bringing together <coughs> lots and lots of different archaeological bodies to create this one big event that we'll see as we go. Um, I've had lots of compliments on the title, which I'd like to point out, Gail wrote and submitted when I was on holiday. <laughs> I didn't necessarily volunteer for this talk, uh, but I'm very happy to be here. Um, so I thought I'd start really by taking you through some of the steps of how we've got to where we've got to. Um, starting in the beginning when I uh, started my role in 2008, um, as many of you will know, I think Bristol doesn't have any dedicated archaeological galleries anymore. So the main way we communicate with the public about all things archaeological is through a programme of events. So they are really important to us. Um, and the Festival of Archaeology is kind of one of those big tranches of work, one of those big events uh, that we put on every year. Um, traditionally, at the beginning, from about 2008, probably to 2012, uh, we coordinated events and created this museum-wide offer. So we were putting on three to four events each year across the museum service, uh, and we have uh, three museums, two <coughs> branch houses and a variety of sites, um, and also a Roman villa. So lots of the attention was focused on this Roman villa that you can see behind me here. The top photo was excavated in the 40s as a road went through it. Uh, and like all the other black and white images of excavations we've seen over the past two days, uh, is entirely staged. <laughs> so this, uh, you can see here, school children excavating the villa. Uh, and they were involved in the excavation, but one of them came to the villa recently uh, and said that they are, under no circumstances were they allowed to wield spades. So that was very reassuring for us. But it does show uh, yeah, that the Bristol Post is still still uh, involved in but this is a, as you see it on the google maps image if you were to search and you can see it's in the center of a big housing estate on the edges of bristol um, and the kinds of activities that we put on none of them were revolutionary you'll all do them in your own museum we employed reenactors we did lots of object handling sessions um, we did tours we did talks nothing particularly <coughs> revolutionary uh, but they were always popular people that came uh, seemed to value them and they were a good thing, but they were very resource heavy. So running events over the course of three weeks as the festival period was then uh, pretty much crippled us. So by the end, we were broken people. Um, and on top of that, the people that did come, the feedback was always really positive. They had a good time. They enjoyed themselves. But the one thing that they were saying again and again was that they didn't know it was on and they hadn't come for the Festival of Archaeology which after three weeks worth of work was always slightly disheartening. Mm -hmm. um, so in 2012, we, 2013, sorry, we set about a different approach uh, and started to try and create a city-wide offer. So we were aware that we were the biggest archaeological kind of institution in the city and that it would be a good thing to start supporting some of our smaller local societies and various heritage sites into also being able to participate in this festival of archaeology. Um, so instead of spreading it out, we wanted to focus and have a big one-day event, thinking slightly naively that this would involve less work. So we got several uh, local societies, heritage sites uh, on board, and created what you can see at the bottom, which was an archaeological passport. And the idea was that you would travel around the city, visit these sites, collect your stamp, and then I think you've got some kind of token sticker if you've collected uh, all of them. Um, so these are some of the events we put on. Uh, we opened the villa, as usual, with reenactors. I think we had a Roman medicus that year. The community farm ran a Roman food trail for us. Our local community group put on a big event at Sea Mills. Uh, the Matthews, a, re a reconstructed ship, uh, dressed up as Tudors and took people on boat rides around the city, the local cemetery put on a trail, and a community group in Bristol recreated a medieval uh, pageant, Pilgrim's Route. Um, so there was a huge amount on offer. It was a great, it was really good to work with all the other groups. We had great experience. 
Um, we enjoyed talking to them and we enjoyed working with them. But as you can see, the visitor numbers, you probably can't see it, but at the bottom, were very disappointingly low. So we had 330 people in total. And still, out of those 330 people, lots of them were still saying that they weren't coming for the Festival of Archaeology. So we knew that our message wasn't getting across. So the following year, we tried to develop the offer in 2014, uh, continuing with this idea of a citywide offer with Bristol Museum at the hub, uh, but involving as many institutions as we possibly, possibly could. Um, instead of being on one day, because lots of the feedback uh, from the few people that had come was that actually one day wasn't enough to get around all those sites. And so the people that did want to come wanted to go to everything, but they didn't want to go to everything on the same day. Um, we had a CBA uh, apprentice that year, and it was part of her work package to work on this, and she did an amazing job and organised eight events spread across the city, uh, ranging from kind of Bronze Age to present day in terms of, of archaeology, but also really spread, as you can see in the map at the bottom, throughout the city. Um, lots of the people that had done stuff with us before wanted to do stuff with, the, with us again, which was really positive. And for the first time ever, we managed to cobble together a budget uh, and so could support some of those groups uh, with reenactors. Um, so the city farm, we had kind of ancient skills sessions there, and then we had reenactors at Emshed and at the Roman villa. Uh, and the visitor numbers were much more encouraging. So if you added up all of those eight events, there were 1,839 visits in total. Slightly annoyingly, most of those still said they were not coming for the Festival of Archaeology, so we still knew that we weren't doing something right. <laughs> Uh, and Emshed, which had the most visitors here, just over a thousand, um, out of everyone else, over 50% uh, had come to see a ceramic statue of Gromit on the Gromit Trail. <laughs> and in fact, they had only really come in to see the Gromit, and it was only because something was going on that they stayed. So great that they stayed, not great that they came to see Gromit rather than us. Um, as well as that, putting on these eight events really was only ever possible because we had a dedicated member of staff. It was a huge amount of work. She went to every single event and activity and I really think it dominated those three weeks, if not more, of her life. Um, so 2015, we had a different idea. Instead of um, spreading across the city, it was too much work and too much scope, instead of spreading across the whole festival, we would bring everyone together at one of our museum sites and celebrate all things archaeological on the one day, in the one place. Uh, and Blaze Museum, which some of you would have been to, I think we've had an SMA conference there years ago, and uh, some of you may know, it's on the northwest edges of the city. Um, it's a 19th century manor house set in 400 acres of grounds, and it's the home to our social history collections, which in reality means toilets. Um, but it's very popular, but it's... Um, in the parkland itself are four Bronze Age barrows, there's two hill forts, there's a possible Roman road, um, there's a possible Roman temple, it's all quite sketchy, uh, and a, a medieval chapel. So it's perfect. it was the perfect location for us. Uh, on top of that is in one of the areas of the city where we know we get the least amount of visitors to our sites. So it's surrounded by housing estates with multiple levels of deprivation, and we know it's the site where the most underrepresented audiences go. So 30%, I think, are uh, from areas that are considered deprived in the city, where the, the institutional baseline is 17%. Uh, and some postcodes of the city, so BS11, which is a neighbouring postcode to this one, we know that 1% of residents visit the museum sites on hold, but 9% visit this site. So it was a key area for us to work in. Um, so this was the dream. Um, we would bring everybody together, regardless of periods, time, anyone that works in archaeology in Bristol, whether that archaeology was happening in Bristol or whether they worked at the university and did their fieldwork in Egypt, it didn't matter. We just wanted everybody connected to archaeology. Anyone that had ever even mentioned the word archaeology, we wanted there to put on this one big event uh, for the public. 
So we set about uh, booking reenactors, and the idea was to have a big outdoor arena, lots of demonstrations, uh, lots of fun activities, lots of stalls, lots of activities. Uh, we booked a geophysics team, they were going to survey the area. Um, just loads and loads of activities happening across the site. Uh, this is what happened. So it didn't just rain, it really, really rained. So we obviously, we had a wet weather plan um, and it was too wet to operate the wet weather plan. So our wet weather plan was anyone that we were paying, essentially the reenactors, they would have to suck it up and sit in the rain. Um, they all refused, apart from the very hardy Vikings. So the Vikings, <laughs> they were okay. They would stay outside. Some of them had forgotten their shoes, so they were outside and barefoot. Uh, the Romans refused to put up their tent because they said it was too expensive. Um, everyone else had to shelter inside uh, the house. Uh, and this is what happened. These are some photos of the day. So despite this, despite the torrential, torrential rain, it was still a success. We managed to carry on with all our activities, our face painting, our children's craft, uh, the local history societies have put on great things. We had uh, medieval music floating through the house. Um, because we booked so many people, we didn't actually really fit in the house. So the room with the toilets had to have uh, our field unit in it, doing fines drawing. Um, but despite this, it kind of worked. There was a real buzz about the day. Uh, and in terms of numbers, it still wasn't as much as the year before, so we had 532 inside the house uh, and 100 that we were of kind of stray dog walkers, very sadly wandering around outside, but we counted them too. <laughs> uh, so although the visitor numbers weren't great, 532, there were still 330 more than that site it had the, the Saturday before. So we knew that people were coming for once. People had started to come um, as it was the Festival of Archaeology. Uh, and the CBA were very supportive and they sent people <coughs> to survey it as part of a wider survey on the Festival of Archaeology as a whole. And we got some great feedback. Um, most of the things that people said uh, were that it was interesting, that people were really good to talk to, uh, that it was great for young and old people. Uh, and that it was fun. So these were positive, positive comments. Um, but what surprised me most, probably, was that it was the stall holders themselves that were so keen to participate. They really valued having this platform where they could talk to people, but also whether they could meet kind of peers and, and other archeologists. Um, so we were really encouraged by that. And some of the local societies that came had actually been quite critical of the museum in past years since our galleries were closed. And really our only interaction with them had been to read their newsletters where they were slacking us off essentially, um, or to give them talks, or to ask them to stop digging holes. So none of those were really positive experiences. So for once, uh, we were having kind of positive engagement with, with our own groups. Um, so that was it. We felt that we had found the model then that we needed to continue and build on. This was the best thing that we had tried that worked. So we set about making this a regular, a regular festival, essentially, um, which wasn't without its challenges. So the first year was a trial year, and I don't know how, but we managed to get it through. But it had raised a number of issues. Uh, one that was we were in no way equipped to run large-scale outdoor events. <laughs> Blaze, was, Blaze is a huge museum and it has one table. So we had had to borrow tables from a villa, which isn't even a permanent structure, to bring them to Blaze so that we could put it on in the first year. So we set about fundraising to get tables, we made our friends do tablecloths, we got donation boxes, and um, we bought some gazebos <coughs> over the kind of next few years so that we had a proper events kit that we could use to put on something slightly bigger than a one table event. Um, annoyingly, in the year when we ran it, in 2015 to the next year, um, Parks, who own the park land, we, the museum runs the house, uh, the parks team run the estates, and the Friends of Blaze run the gardens behind it, so it's quite a split-up site. Um, 
Parks had asked for us to apply for official site permission form. So site permission is run by the city council, but it's really for big event organisers that put on music festivals on the downs <coughs> or these huge fun travelling fun fairs. But even though they had just moved into our building and become the same team, we still had to go through this very rigorous process, which although I think uh, grumbled a lot, it was ultimately a good, a good process. So they made us create uh, an event plan that had things like traffic management, access, ingress, all manner of things that we probably never would have thought of, because essentially we were just, we thought we were just using the lawns to our own house, but they thought slightly differently. Um, despite being in the nearby office, uh, we had to send them copies of our own insurance and public liability, even though we were the same the same people, but we also had to send them copies of our lost child policy uh, and all kinds of public documents and we had to create a really thorough and rigorous risk assessment that they went through with a fine, a fine tooth comb. But having grumbled for a whole year about them, um, once it was done, that was it. It was something that we could just build on year on year. Um, and as if that wasn't enough, uh, we had recently set up a museum costume group. So every time an exhibition comes to the museum, so when the Staffordshire Hall would come, our costume group would whip up 100 Anglo-Saxon costumes in a night. Uh, when the skeletons came, they, I made them stitch skeletons onto Asda sweatshirts, which they said took them days and days and days. Uh, but that had been quite successful, so I thought oh, I'll set up a cooking group, thinking that would be similarly easy. Uh, but it turns out there's a quite a lot of laws around <laughs> food safety and hygiene before you give members of the public uh, medieval feasts. Um, so it involved a lot of time with environmental health, who were very kind and very patient, but working out what the laws surrounding giving the public food were. And I won't go into them, it's probably a whole another uh, talk. Um, but essentially it was keeping a track of what we'd bought, where we'd sourced it, and lots of allergen information and how we would do it. It was also involved training our volunteers in food safety, which was, again, essentially just wash your hands a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and finally, um, animals. It was the first time we really, <coughs> because most of our sites are indoors, and I think part of the reason that previous years the festival had been less successful is that the Festival of Archaeology is in the summer holidays, so as soon as it gets sunny, no one wants to go inside to a museum. Um, whereas Blaze, we had this big outdoor space, which meant that real actors could bring the animals that they wanted to. And we thought that would be good, it would be very popular, and our safety team thought we needed to write a risk assessment for each animal. Um, <laughs> Blaze is a big open park, room, so there are lots of dogs off and on the lead. So we had to write uh, risk assessments for the dogs, but also for the duck, the very lovely duck you see, and a really naughty, naughty raven. Um, but I think 2016 was kind of the tipping point where the festival kind of really got into its stride and became the success that we think it is uh, today. So I've just got a few slides, I don't expect you to read the words, um, and a few nice pictures, kind of highlights of the past three years almost. Um, so 2016, um, we managed to get more and more people involved uh, in running it. So both Cotswold Archaeology and Wessex Archaeology joined us, uh, and they were very good and very professional at putting on children's activities and craft sessions, which meant that we no longer had to. So instead of running the event, running the activities, and just generally running around, we could now oversee them and take much more of an operational uh, role. Um, and there were great things that happened. There were mini excavations, mini mosaics, um, lots of prehistoric pottery. There were tours of the estate. So for the first time, the house and grounds were kind of interacting as one, and you could experience it as one experience rather than the kind of internal politics of parks owning one, the friends owning another. Uh, and it was very successful. And these two chaps, I think, made... Uh, the Festival of Archaeology booklet and plastered all over our website. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was much more successful in terms of visitor numbers, but also visitor experience and satisfaction. So we had just over a thousand um, visits uh, on the day. Uh, the following year, more and more people got involved. Um, we had another local archaeological company got on board. 
Uh, the cathedral came and put on lots of activities. Um, and after pretty much a year of chasing and asking everyone I've ever met, National Trust and Historic England also came, uh, which was a real breakthrough because both have offices based in Bristol and it seems weird to offer something archaeological without them. But they came and we, uh, we had lots and lots of activities. Each year our kind of budget went down, so each year we've picked up different skills. So we've learned to do blue Iron Age face painting. Uh, we've got an Iron Age coin die so that we can make uh, Iron Age coins. Um, we did, the cathedral did kind of smelly pouches. Uh, what was very popular was Wessex did Play-Doh poo. So the outside was covered in kind of blue Play-Doh poo. Um, but there was a huge amount of offer on offer. Um, and again, it was sunny, which meant we had more visitors yet again. So 1,359 visits outside, 971 inside. And we're never really sure who we count them in that way, because lots of visitors to Blaze have dogs, which we don't let into the museum. So we know that some of those visits, we know those people aren't the same people, but a lot, there will be lots of overlap. So we count outside and inside, which is why uh, you see so many numbers. And then finally, 2018, our last year, um, I was on maternity leave, but Gail made me do it anyway. That's not <laughs> <laughs> um, But conveniently, I had quite a lot of waking hours, time on my hands, so I probably put more effort into last year than ever before. Uh, but it also meant that I probably started a lot earlier than ever before, because I didn't have any other jobs, I was just sat around. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, it was also the year that the CBA decided not to run the festival this year, so it meant that we had to create our own uh, branding. We, weren't, we couldn't rely on that kind of central fund anymore, but I think we, we managed to cobble our, event, our graphic team into creating a kind of more, a more specific uh, look for us, which we were pleased with. Uh, and again, more and more people on board. Um, we've got the Church's Conservation Trust uh, involved and NAFAS, the Fine and Decorative Arts Society. We wrote them in. Uh, a, a lovely metal, local metal detector also what runs something called Safe, Safe Archery, which turned out was, was much safer than I thought um, once we had eliminated the, his idea to do battle um, axe throwing. Mm. Um, when I told Parks, there's a lot of antisocial behaviour at Blaze, especially recently, when I told Parks that we were doing archery um, and possibly battle archery, their response was, are you essentially arming the youth? <laughs> <laughs> but we didn't, and we weren't, and it was safe, and it was really, really popular. Uh, and we had all kinds of activities, more than ever, ever before. Uh, we had night puppets, Cotswold made soap, which was really popular, so popular they ran out of soap halfway through the day. There was uh, gr uh, <coughs> corn grinding, archery, making Viking braids, and you could still take all these tours and talks kind of across the estate run by our local societies. So in terms of uh, visitors, yeah, we had uh, 1,286 outside, inside, sorry, 982 to the lawns and 400 to the archery because the archery was in a slightly different place. And again, I think not all the groups were definitely going to each. Um, but the real star of the show was the uh, right at the end, the one piece of medieval poo that Cotswold brought along. And I think that was the thing that people most wanted to see inside the house. But because it was a very windy and wet year, it was the year of the heat wave, and it was the one day of the heat wave where it rained, and there were high winds. So two hours after we put the gazebos up, we took them all down, and we were exactly where we began. <laughs> um, but it meant so most of the stuff had to shelter in the house, but it did create large queues outside the house, so it created quite this feeling of uh, popularness. So this is where we are today. Um, you can see visitor numbers have steadily increased. Um, the festivals become really embedded in the museum calendar, so people no longer question why we're doing it, why we need a budget. It's something that happens and will always, hopefully, happen. It's a, bit, it's a big thing in Blaze's calendar. Uh, we've moved from having just 13 stalls to 24 stalls. We've moved away, really, from employing reenactors, and we always get one or two groups that are local, uh, to offering... Uh, the activities through the stallholders themselves uh, and we've moved away from running everything ourselves to kind of delegating it and, and spreading it out 
Um, we've also, on site at any one time, there's, it involves a huge amount of staff and volunteers. So from 66 in the beginning, and that included 30 reenactors, to 99 at the end, and I think that included about 10 reenactors. So there's a huge amount of staff involved, and the CBA have evaluated it in 2015 and 17, uh, and as you can see, our excellent rating is bumping up all the time. Um, and in true tradition, we're putting your own children on slides. Here is mine looking at, in awe at finding quite a weird Roman uh, plastic soldier in one of the sandpits. <laughs> so the visitor feedback is great, and it's, it's gathered partially from people sending us compliments through social media, which are the top two, uh, to the CBA's collection. And the things that come up are that it's fun, it's good for the kids, and the most important thing that came up recently in the last survey, and it came up pretty much in every statement, was that it was free. And that's really important for us, especially where, where the museum is, that it was free. Um, and again, the stall holder uh, feedback it's just been really positive. People want to come. You know, everyone that's come has always come the following year. Um, they're always talking about how it's great to see people, uh, how busy they are. Lots of the local societies managed to slowly move them off from looking menacing in the corner with a leaflet to actually offering something for people to do. And that's been quite a hard process. But even they are now appreciative of... Uh, that it's a good thing to do and that engages everyone of all ages. And we always ask them with a survey monkey survey at the end, what are the benefits to you and your institution? Uh, and the things that come across are that it's great for public engagement and to raise profile in your local area. Places like the university, they do lots of public engagement, but they don't do much in Bristol itself, so it's important for them to be seen to doing that. And a lot of the local groups uh, talk about how it's really driving up some of their membership, or at least interest in their membership, which is important for them because lots of their members are of a certain age, I think. Um, uh, but what's, I guess, important for us as well, that it really benefits us too. It's busy and it's a lot of work, but it really puts us at the centre of archaeological things happening in the city. And it's, it's forged much more positive relationships with some of the groups that we didn't necessarily... Uh, work with so closely before. So I'll give you some quick lessons learned and then I think my time is done. But I think what's the most positive thing has been this working together, um, this idea of like a shared project where we all work together for the same common goal. It's the only time where all of those people really are in the same room at the same time doing something together rather than sat around a meeting room kind of arguing or debating something. We're all working on the same thing. And it's really only because of that huge number of people give up their time and their effort. They bring all the materials. We don't pay them anyway. They bring everything for free. It means we can create this really varied and free offer that we would never, ever be able to put on, on by ourselves. Um, in terms of kind of lessons learned, the paperwork has been very, very painful. But we now have comprehensive event plans. We have organizers' packs. Uh, we have photo forms. We have signs. So we have a huge amount that now we just need to tweak every year. So although it was very laborious at the start, um, it's now something that's good to go. Uh, and then really what I have learned over the years is just to expect the worst. Um, every year something goes wrong, the wet weather plan isn't weather good enough, something happens and we just have to think on our feet. Normally front of house tell me the week before that they don't have enough staff to open the building. Um, but we have learnt to stop checking the weather, stop asking front of house, and just plough on through, and then we'll all be okay. Uh, and then what I really want to express is kind of the lessons I've learned are in terms of marketing, because now people come and they are coming because it is a festival of archaeology event. Um, and what we've learned over the years is that it's so important to have it in the summer holidays. That is how we get listed on all the local Facebook groups, and we know that Bristol parents use Facebook much more for organising activities, as I'm sure they do elsewhere. So we make sure that we're flagged up by those key people that have a big parent following. So there's the Bishopston mum, the Portishead parent, and my favourite, which is Help It's the School Holidays. But all of them feature us, list us, and then promote us. And really, it's this sense of the power of social media. So um, we have a Facebook event. We've had one for the past three years. 
um, but it's risen from kind of 164 being interested to 2,200 being interested. Part of that was because we now include all the other organisers and we make them kind of co-hosts so it reaches their wide networks. Part of that was because I was doing a lot of it in the middle of the night and just kept going. Uh, but we've reached what we are pleased with in terms of kind of visitor numbers. Uh, and it's five o'clock, so I'll finish now.